to a few minutes, uh, eight minutes to the presentation. I'm Tony Mormino, the Technical Sales and Marketing Director for Insight Partners, and I have an amazing guest today. I have Mark Fly, PE, a very sought after Ashray speaker and and guy with uh, with Aon. He's going to talk to you a little bit. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm doing great. Awesome. Good to be yeah. here. Mark's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was at the Ashray show in Canada. Uh, he just flew back yesterday, I believe. And yeah, I last am, night. And last night, and he got up bright and early to help us with the show today. And if you're joining us and watching in, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Um, we're going to talk about HVAC fans, kind of like an HVAC fans 101 does qualify for PDH credits and Mark's got an amazing um, career of experience he's going to share with us. So we we hope that you enjoy the show. So Mark's in Tulsa. I am located in Asheville, North Carolina, up here in the mountains. It's a gorgeous day. It's sunny. It's 74 degrees and dry. It's really nice. I'd love to hear where you all are from. If you're tuning in and want to put it in the chat, it's so cool. We get people from other countries. We get people from in the Southeast where we're located. We get people from Canada, California, you name it. People from all over watch our program and we really, truly enjoy it. So, um, oh, thanks, Austin. Appreciate your comment. Uh, thanks for being here. We're glad to be here and we're super excited. And we, you know, I personally want to thank everybody who supports our online shows. We really do enjoy doing these. It's a lot of fun and uh, enjoy getting the feedback and, and stuff in the chat. So, um, hey, Ryan. Ryan's checking in from Detroit. Well, thank you, Ryan, for joining us. I, your name looks familiar. I know I've seen you on here before. Mike from York, South Carolina. Oh, welcome, Mike. Cool. H how was the Ash Ratio, Mark? Oh, it, it, it was really good. I mean, this was this is the annual meeting, which is the business meeting and uh, technical committee meetings of Ash Ray. So there isn't a show associated with it. but. But it, uh, gotcha. but it's always it's always fun to get to see all my friends I've known 35 years that I see twice a year. So, right, right, that's awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for being here, man. We really appreciate it. Jesse from Jacksonville, what's up, Jesse? Uh, my old stomping grounds, Wendell from Raleigh. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Marcelo from St. Petersburg. Um, we've got someone from Bursa. Hmm, interesting. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Um, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Again, Tony Mormino with Insight Partners, and we have a great presentation. We have an amazing uh, presenter today, uh, Mark Fly uh, with Aon. Mark's been around for for a few years. You got a couple years of experience, right, Mark? Just a few. Yeah. Just a few. And uh, real deal experience, designing, engineering equipment uh, right in the factory in Aon. So he's going to share um, a lot of his experience with with fans. And, um, you know, fans is one of those things. It's just like a staple. you got to know it if you're in this business. Uh, Iman Higgins, I hope I'm saying your name right. Welcome uh, from Austin. We've got uh, Ray Ann from, from Prague. Welcome. Uh, we've got Luke from Toronto. And Aaron, uh, oh, Aaron Coble, what's up, Aaron? From Greensboro. Corey, welcome. Corey from Orlando. Sarah, welcome from Atlanta. And uh, again, thank you all so much. We're gonna get started here in just a few minutes. Uh, Mark Fly is our presenter today with Aon, and he's got tons of experience and a very sought after uh, presenter and heavily involved in, in ASHRAE. Hey, Dan, how's it going this morning? Dan is in Canton, North Carolina, which just just over yonder, as we say up here in the mountains. Um, Lindsay, hello from rainy Houston. Hello, Lindsay. Uh, Stevens, good morning. Welcome. We're glad you're here. And uh, glad all you guys are here. Thank you. We've got someone from Dubai here. Pretty cool. It's amazing when we do these shows, you know, I'm, how many people see it and, and from what, from what uh, parts of the world. So. Anyway, so we are super excited. You all are here. Thanks again. A little over three minutes, we'll get started here. It's a one hour uh, PDH presentation on fans. Um, hey, Griffin, good morning from Norcross. Griffin's from Norcross, Georgia. Uh, Marlon, welcome. Glad you're here. And uh, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. I hope, I hope you can hear us, by the way. Usually I'll do a sound check to see if you guys can. Uh, sometimes we go live and, you know, we're not 
we're not um you know news guys we're just hvc guys trying to get the get the word out and sometimes we have some technical difficulties even though we rehearse a bunch but uh hopefully you all can hear and and see us okay uh marlon's from california thank you for joining us and okay so no factory today mark this is your work day uh I, I'm not in the factory right now, but I, I'm actually in my home office, but uh, yeah, I'm, go, I'm going in this afternoon for a little bit, try to catch up on all the email and stuff. I've been gone since last yeah, Friday. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, well cool. Uh, Matthew, good morning. Um, Chilton is from Hot Springs, North Carolina. Wow, that is a real small town. I live in Marshall, which is just north of Asheville, and Hot Springs is even smaller than Marshall, but it's a beautiful place. Uh, Brian Clark, good morning. Sean McConnell says, sounded good. Sean is about 15 feet this way or this way in the office next <laughs> to me. So thank you, Sean. Um, he probably hears my big mouth over the microphone anyway. Um, Sagar, I think that's how you pronounce that. Welcome. And we'll get started here in just a minute. Uh, we got a one hour. Um, James, good morning. We got a little one hour PDH. Uh, uh, class here for you on HVAC fans. So my email there is on the streamer and I'll share it a few times and you can email me and get uh, your PD8 certificate and also a, PD, a PDF of the presentation, which Mark has said um, we can give to you. So it's a great resource to have that. I hope that you all email me and get a copy of that. It's, good. it's really, really good information. Uh, hey, Angel, welcome. Uh, good morning. Oh, that's right. Peerless Blowers is in Hot Springs. That's right. Chilton, we, we're glad you're here. And we're going to get started here in just a minute. Okay. You're going to see me moving around, doing some behind the scenes stuff. Thank you all so much again for joining us. We greatly, greatly appreciate it. These have been tons of fun to do them live. There's something about doing them live. I'm LinkedIn. We're streaming live on LinkedIn and YouTube right now. Most people watching on LinkedIn and uh, really appreciate it. Concord, North Carolina. Travis, welcome. Welcome to everybody. Tyler, what's up? <laughs> good, good morning, Tyler. Welcome. And I'm going to go ahead and get ready here. Let's see if I can share these screens without killing the killing the feed mark. That would probably not be a good thing. Um, okay, a few seconds here. We'll get started. And then I'm going to turn this music off. And thank you all so much. We're getting started here right now. So, all right, I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to turn on the background music. We should. Okay, so we're going to get started here. Just a second, I'll do a quick introduction and I will do talk a little bit about who we are at Insight Partners. And then I'll turn it over to Mark for the expertise um, he's going to share with us. So, welcome again. A little virtual handshake from Insight Partners. My name is Tony Mormino. I'm the marketing director here at Insight. And I have Mark Fly with us, who's the PE, he's with Aon, he's got years of experience, he's gonna give us a presentation on fans, and I'll give you an overview, a bio of Mark here in just a second. Before we start that, I wanna just tell you a little bit about Insight Partners, just take about two or three minutes here. So we're we're in the HVAC business. We sell HVAC equipment, we, sell, we have a service department, controls, parts, and recon. Um, we have 13 offices in the Southeast, which you can see um, right here. And then we have five basic divisions of our business. We have equipment, service, parts, controls, and recon. And um, for equipment, we rep major product lines like Aon, Armstrong, Bosch, Samsung. You can see a bunch more there. And you go to insightusa.com to see all the lines that we rep throughout the Southeast um, in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. We have a full service division, which covers our whole area. We have parts departments throughout our territory in the Southeast. We currently have five parts counters open, parts centers open, and we have three that we're opening up very shortly. So we're super, super excited about that to grow our parts business. So our brand promise, what we're trying to do is become a comprehensive HVAC and solutions provider with a nationwide network of experts committed to our local partner success. And our local partners are you, our customers and our viewers. So thank you. We cannot do that without our most valuable asset, which is people. And I just want to welcome aboard to the Insight family, the following names, the following people who we've hired in the last couple months. So Nolan Testa, Wendy Smith, Wade Romans, Sam Braddock, 
Trevor Marone, Patrick Doherty, Ricardo Dravandi, Mike Gray, James Berry, Dwight Gerard, Matt Allen, and Michael Conrad. Welcome, welcome, welcome. They've all started within the last, I believe, approximately two months. So welcome aboard. We are currently hiring if you're looking for an HVAC job, account executives, service technicians, parts store managers, area service managers, OEM parts sales reps, and parts territory managers. My email is right there. You can send, um, okay, I think we may have lost. I'm gonna keep going here. I'm not sure if we're still online or not, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, yeah. Tony, you're you're still online, but you're you paused for a second. So Okay, I think I'm back. Can you hear me now? I I can. Okay. I'm gonna assume we're still rolling. I had a little warning pop up here, but you never know with this stuff. Okay. So we believe that working together, we're stronger. So we've invested uh, a lot of time and money as a company and resources in training uh, the HVAC community. So we do in-person training with what with what we call the HVAC Service Academy, where we go around locally to do in-person training on our major products line, product lines. We also do a lot of training online like we're doing right now. So we have our YouTube channel, HVAC TV. We have the Engineers HVAC podcast, so come check us out there. And we also do a lot of live shows here on LinkedIn. So thank you all so much. It's been a true joy um, to be doing these. And thank you all for supporting us and joining us online. So. Get started with the presentation here. Before we get started again, if you want to write my email down, tmormino at insightusa.com, this is where you can get your PDH credits and also your a PDF of the presentation, which Mark has graciously um, um, allowed us to share. Please put any questions in the chat, in the chat, in the comments. And what we'll do is probably um, get to those questions after the presentation. So, so chat away throw them in there and we'll, we'll address them afterwards. Okay, so let's get started with the presentation. Before we get started, I wanna just introduce our, our um, speaker today, which is Mark Fly. Uh, Mark Fly has over 40 years of experience as a researcher, consulting engineer, contractor, and manufacturer in the HVAC industry. He is currently executive director at the Norm Asgrimson Innovative Center at Aon Inc. in Tulsa, Oklahoma, having served as director of engineering for Aon for 11 years prior to taking that position. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Physics from Missouri State University and is a licensed engineer in two states. So I've known Mark for quite some time being the Aon rep and uh, he's got invaluable experience. So we're gonna turn it over to Mark and he's gonna give us a PDH presentation on fans and he'll walk through in a second here what he's gonna actually present. So I'm gonna unshare my screen. And okay. so Mark, how are you? I'm I'm doing well, Tony. It's uh this 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 is fun. I don't know that I've done quite as slick a presentation online as this. So we'll we'll see how this goes, right? So Yeah, I like it. So so and I got lots of slides, so I'm going to try to keep moving and not tell too many stories, which I think <laughs> We'll try and keep you on track, Mark. I'll I'll do try my to keep best. you going. So okay. okay. So so we're going to talk about fans and and really talk about fans. Obviously, from HVAC manufacturing or HVAC standpoint, I have a bias of uh, toward probably larger equipment. So I'm going to talk a lot more about uh, backward inclined type fans than than others. But we're going to hit the high points on on several different things and. Uh, uh, general disclaimer, these are Mark Fly's opinions, not necessarily the opinions of anybody else. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, you know, so let's let's go, go ahead and get started. So, you know, the learning objectives uh, basically of this of this class and this class I do a lot for uh, as part of my, the ASHRAE Distinguished Lecture Program for ASHRAE. So I run around and do it in local chapters a lot. But, uh, is to know different fan types and their general characteristics. We're going to talk a lot about fan curves and fan laws. Uh, I hopefully, if you get nothing else, you're going to really understand what fan stall and and the unstable region of the fan operating envelope is and why you want to avoid it. <clears throat> and basically, just get try to give you enough information to select the best type fan 
and best selection of size of fan for flow characteristics and acoustical performance and everything else. So, um, and the last thing I'm going to cover is some some fan efficiency metrics that you may or may not have heard of, uh, but probably will. So, moving into fan types, the general fan types, probably the most prominent fan in the industry is the forward curve fan or FC fan. Sometimes you call it, you hear these called squirrel cage fans. Um, uh, part of the reason for that is is uh, um, is that these these are very inexpensive fans, and they have some characteristics that 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 make them uh, good for applications where the fan is very close to the space. We'll talk a little bit about that. You know, part of the downside of these fans is they don't do well on duct. They really want duct work on them. They would really like to have a long straight duct right off the discharge. Um, and they can be in general louder at higher static pressures. So they're, they're good fans, but you kind of want to keep them under three inches of external static pressure uh, across the fan. And, and like I said, they are, they are relatively inexpensive. If we kind of take a next step up in the evolution of fans in the industry, we, we went to what we called a backward inclined fan. And there are several flavors, but they're the same uh, characteristic type fan, which means uh, these are fans that use a fan blade configuration that depends primarily on aerodynamic lift to, to do the work. So those are backward inclined, backward curve, and airfoil or just variations on the generic backward inclined uh, uh, type fan blade. And if you put that in a housing, which we call a centrifugal fan, we call these backward inclined, backward curve or airfoil centrifugal fans. They are there again, they are most efficient with duct work on them. So in a draw through uh, <coughs> configuration with a ducted discharge, um, one of the th characteristics of the way these fans are rated is that because a lot of the things that you put on this fan are actually in the inlet, they're not actually in the performance data because you don't know how big a shiv or fan guard or something else are on there. So you have to be a little careful about that. <clears throat> and if you can't duck them, there is a significant energy loss. And that's true of any centrifugal fan or any house fan or um, even an FC fan, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about that when we get to system effects. Now, my favorite fan is a plenum fan. I've spent most of my career designing HVAC equipment. I'm always putting fans inside boxes, and I'm, and I'm very often blowing through something, be it a coil, a final filter, or a gas furnace, or something else. And plenum fans are, tip, are, are a, a, a backward inclined fan without a housing around it. So it just pressurizes a plenum. Um, so these are very good, five to, up to five to six inches of static pressure. Um, and those are kind of general guidelines. I've, I've seen them run a lot higher. I, sometimes they run a lot lower, but those, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the normal range you see them running at. They can be hot, quieter in application than a house fan. They can actually be more efficient in application. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but it kind of depends. It, it's dependent on how we measure efficiency. But uh, many times you can put a plenum fan in an application where you had a house fan if, you, if you're looking at both of those. And even though the efficiency number on that house fan may show to be higher, you actually have less brake horsepower input going into the fan or less power going into the fan. So, <clears throat> and uh, you know, the, they're very forgiving of system effects with the exception, like all fans is you have to be very careful on the inlet side of it. So if you have a very short return air plenum into these as they're normally mounted uh, horizontally, then the, the, the air doesn't want to turn into it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, So, you know, crowding the supply fan, uh, crowding the inlet on any of them, really supplier or not. And and they can be of any BI fan type or backward inclined fan type, backward inclined, backward curve or airflow. Um, 
The other really prominent fan you see in HVAC are prop fans, or sometimes called axial fans, which are basically the panel or panel fans. These are propeller blades, typically in some kind of short housing, and they're typically used on uh, uh, condenser fans. They you can also see them sometimes for return of exhaust. They get used a lot for general building ventilation uh, exhaust fans. Um, they don't like high static pressures in general. It's just a plain uh, standard uh, axial type fan. And, and they tend to be loud, get very loud at medium to high statics. Now, if you want to get a little bit more out of that, out of those axial type fans, you can put them in a longer case, in which case they call them a short case axial fan. Um, they, they get more efficient than a standard prop fan. Um, they are, obviously there's more material costs, so they're more expensive. And most variations of what people, when people talk about quiet condenser fans or quiet, uh, act, some kind of quiet prop fans, we're talking about um, uh, some type of short case axial fan. And then if you wanna take that, that axial fan, put it on steroids, uh, it's a vein axial fan. <clears throat> vein axial fans are velocity pressure machines. They like to move lots of air really fast. And you don't see them as often today because of energy efficiency concerns and sound concerns. Uh, used to see them a lot in high rise buildings. They used to be used a lot in what we used to call back when I started in the business built up systems where you would have fan rooms, not fan equipment. Um, you know, the, one of the good characteristics is even though they're loud, they make sound at, that most of the sound generated is at a higher frequency, which is easy to attenuate. So like for instance, in our laboratory, we use vein axial fans in our sound chamber to for pressure equalization because I can put sound traps on each side of it and do a very effective job of getting it very, very quiet. Um, and like all fans, like I said, there are anything that involves high velocity, you gotta be very careful about the inlet and the outlet of the fans. Uh, they are, they tend to be long, very long. And then there's a kind of a, a crossbreed between axial fans and centrifugal fans called a mixed flow fan. Been around for a few years. They kind of have a narrow range of operation where they're really good. I mean, most of these fans will run outside what I'm talking about, but usually five, six, seven inches. Uh, and the, and the most prominent reason people are interested in mixed flow fans is they have a very flat sound spectrum, meaning it's very, very even, not a lot of tones, kind of more of the waterfall type sound. So from an acoustic standpoint, they can be very quiet. So kind of went through those. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about the actual fan blades. So the, the first one um, up here, is the FC fan. I always kind of like to think of FC fans as scoops. They kind of scoop up air and throw it down the ductwork. And a forward, it's a, called a forward curve blade. There's one I didn't really talk about because it's not really an HVAC fan. It's a radial blade fan. If you own a vacuum cleaner, uh, you probably have some variation on a radial blade fan and you know how quiet they are or not. Um, they're used a lot in material handling because they move material through them. So dust collectors and uh, paper and pulp mills. And then the one that I was talking about before, this backward incline fan, you'll notice is kind of different, has a opposite slope than an FC fan. And, and like I said, it uses aerodynamic lift and we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, so, as we look at the fan curves on these different type fans, there's some basic characteristics Then they kind of fall into two categories. Forward curve fans, the more air you move, the more power they take. So the absolute worst thing you can do on a forward curve fan is set it in the middle of a table and just turn it on. It likes to have a little static on it to help control that static pressure. So out until the till it has zero static, the power is going to increase. Um, so, uh, so it continue, increases continuously with flow. There is some aerodynamic lift characteristics in an FC fan, but it's not the prominent method of, of moving air. 
and axial blade fans act the same there again these are the air pushers what i like to talk about is the air pushers and and like i said they're they're suitable for material handling and power increases with flow uh, prop fans have a peak power because the blade on a prop has an aerodynamic lift component to it there is some flow through that fan that matches the pitch of that fan blade perfectly to give you the the best efficiency and so there's a peak in that power and a peak in that efficiency um, uh, and like like i said they're low volume or, or low pressure high volume fans um, and a backward inclined fan is is has a similar characteristic it has that that airflow through it where it matches perfectly the angle of the of the of the blade so that you get the maximum aerodynamic peak for that application so it, there's a peak in that power and then this this chart is absolutely not based on research this is a world according to mark and and i i this chart's probably 20 years old since i put it together and i would probably say i i in today's world i would move for uh backward incline uh and backward curve plenum fans up a little bit uh you know but other than this it just kind of gives you a kind of a range of there's a progression so you know don't use a radial fan to do one inch of static pressure that doesn't make any sense or a vein axial fan and uh using a backward an airfoil backward inclined house fan to do half an inch of static pressure is kind of is is a lot of waste of money and they're not terribly efficient there, really. other concept that a lot of people have heard of i haven't heard this lately as much as i used to but you still see it in a lot of engineer specs especially if engineers don't change their specs very often and that's fan class and so fan class is something it's 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 defined in AMCA 99 which is the air movement control association the people in the u.s that kind of oversee uh fan standards and in a fan class is kind of a pressure and flow rating of a fan and it's really thought of as a pressure rating and so these three blue lines you see here class one two and three are um are are really just uh defining and you have to be completely above that line to be called in that class so the fan classes are kind of used for how robust is your fan and the way you make a fan a higher class is you make the blades heavier the get pick up the gauge of the metal that they're made out of put more welding on them make them more robust from a manufact fan manufacturing standpoint really the limitation on the fan is how fast we spin it so so it really is the max speed and so so you plot that max speed on this curve and then it'll fall in a class one class two or class three uh, as a designer of hvac equipment i can tell you i pay absolutely no attention to fan class i, I always just want to know what speed it is and then i look at my application and am i ever going to exceed that speed so so when fans fail fans fail in kind of two ways they fa fail from centrifugal force on the blades and i'm talking about you know axial type i mean uh, centrifugal type fans like well, like we're going to be talking a lot about so what happens is either the in a centrifugal fan the front plate one it, and the back plate the one up against the inlet cone basically try to come together as the blades bend in the middle from centrifugal force or they decide to leave the fan and eject due to the centrifugal force. So, so uh, fan failures many times involve shrapnel and they, they're really exciting. And that's the reason I test all my fans in a one foot thick concrete reverberation room. So uh, yeah, so don't run a fan faster than, than, it's, than it's rated max speed. That, that comes from a man of experience right there. That, when you've got yes. the concrete room and you're not in it. Yeah, yes, and and, uh, and I've blown up plenty of fans in my lifetime. <laughs> um, and it's less prevalent today because we're seeing a lot more direct drive fans. On, mm -hmm. Almost everything Aon does is direct drive. But the classic way that, that people would overspeed these fans would 
would be they would have some fan change out. The service mechanic would go out and maybe he's a brand new service mechanic and he'd accidentally get the wrong shiv and put the big shiv on the motor and the little shiv on the fan. Mm. And that'll make it go really, really, really fast until the blades decide to leave the housing. <laughs> so, you know, I've thrown fan blades through cabinets, stuck them. I've seen them go through roof structures, be sticking in the yard outside the building. Uh, all kinds of really exciting things happen. Yeah, I'm sure. And so we're going to talk talk a lot about different types of fan failures. So uh, now one of the con one of the things I also like to think about is the static pressure that a fan can make is kind of set by the tip speed. How fast that outside edge of that blade goes around kind of sets the static pressure. And it, you know, from a conceptual standpoint, I'll you know kind of keep that in mind. Um, so you know that that pressure is based on 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 obviously the the diameter and the rpm that it's spinning around <clears throat> and the you know the the fan speed diameter of blades tends to determine the also de tends to determine the flow how much can it gulp as each rotation as it goes around so <clears throat> okay we're going to talk a lot about fan curves and fan laws so this is kind of the classic fan curve and this is the constant arc the blue line is the constant rpm and you'll typically this is how they're plotted most fan curves that they show the stuff over here towards zero flow you'll see this nice little dip kind of looks like a third order curve fit if you remember that from school and then you're then you you run that speed to wherever it uh crosses what we call the selection point um and that selection point, uh, let me go back to here. That selection point is the flow and the static pressure you need that fan to do for your particular application. And if you draw a, a squared function curve through that selection point, we call that the system curve. We're going to talk a lot about system curves here in a minute. We can also plot on that a horsepower curve. And notice there's a peak static pressure on the static pressure curve. And, and when I'm talking about BI fans, there's also a steep peak power point on that curve, typically a little bit to the right of the pressure peak. And uh, my non-scientific 40 something year experience uh, observation is the more efficient the fan, the closer those two peaks get together. Uh, that's that's just kind of something I I always think about when somebody comes to me and says I've got this really really efficient fan or or if we narrow the wheel we can get more efficiency out of this or we can do this or do that and typically we're moving those peaks closer um, and if we plot the efficiency on that curve it also has a peak and it happens to peak at the peak uh, um, of the of the fan power so that is that point where that fan uh, blade approaches the airflow coming into it at that perfect angle so that the airplane wing lift out of that blade is as good as it's going to get. <clears throat> so this peak in the, in the static pressure we call the stall point. And, um, and these fan curves are not, and the CFD guys would argue with me, but these fan curves traditionally have been empirical data. They are measured data. And so for a typical fan, typically we'll measure, we'll run it at a speed, we'll measure static and flow at, at uh, 10 point, points across that curve. Uh, if, you, if you run them in reverberant rooms, you run them over there in this, uh, past this stall point in the unstable region of the curve. I've done a lot of that in my lifetime because I really wanted to understand what was going on there. Uh, but, and then, then we do this curve fit. The curve fit is uh, typically called a cubic spline under tension. If you've ever done a lot of stuff in Excel spreadsheet and there's a little button in there on the graph that says smooth curve, that's a cubic spline under tension. So it basically says, I'm going to draw a curve. It's going to go through every data point and it's not going to wander around a lot in between. I'm going to pull that string tight. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, the efficiency is kind of calculated from these flow and pressure curves. 
And that's, like I said, that stall point is that peak static pressure point. Well, if you've done a lot of dumb things in my life, like run fans a lot at, around that stall point in nice concrete rooms where it's safe, because fans don't really like to run at that unstable region. What you find is there isn't this nice, smooth, third order looking curve. There's actually a discontinuity of that. So what really is happening there is the fan blade is stalling. <clears throat> um, and and it's, it's just like an airplane wing. It quits flying at this point. And actually, if you want to play around with it, depending on which side you approach it from, you can keep the air attached to that blade a little farther when you're coming from high flow to low than you can from low to high and you actually get a little overlap but there's this discontinuity in that fan uh, flow characteristic there <clears throat> and so we 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 have a system curve that we kind of call this the stall area or the stall curve that passes through that that peak point and because it is an uh, unstable region of the fan, you can measure 100 fans and that peak point will move around a little bit because it's really dependent on just how perfect that fan blade is put together and how perfect the angle is and how smooth the, even down to how smooth the surface of the blades are. So uh, it's it's unstable region. So like I said, in, in, a, in a perfect world, we want the, the airflow to attach to the air to the to the blade and the blades act like airplane wings they use aerodynamic lift and the the distance over the top of the blade is farther than the distance over the i mean than the bottom so the velocity is higher so you get lift from that higher velocity creates a lower pressure there now when you go into stall basically what happens is you've slowed that plane down or that airplane wing down to the point that you no longer attach the blades. You start getting eddy currents around the blades. We call it blade separation. That's typically what makes noise in fans. It also what, what, what makes that static pressure capability of that fan drop because it can no longer uh, create the lift it has and it goes from the aerodynamic lift mode to the air pusher mode. So Mark, <clears throat> is it when it's install, it's it's still spinning at the RPM, but it's not moving the air. Is that correct? Right. Okay. It's not. It's not moving the air as efficiency. It's still moving some air because I mean, even and it, people and service guys know this. Even if you run a backward inclined fan backwards, they actually do still move a little bit of air. Not very much, and right, not very capable right. of static. So, gotcha. so, so what happens when you stall this fan? You put so much pressure across that fan, it can't move air across it fast enough and and it and it separates and so and as soon as, as soon as it stalls the pressure in that area around that blade that micro environmental place pressure drops and when the pressure drops the fan blade says oh hey i can pick back up i can pump again i i'm no longer have this restrictive high pressure across it because it it dropped there and so one of the reasons people call it surge is because it's going in and out of stall rapidly and hmm. fan blades stall by blade so every blade is stalling at a little different time based on its own little microclimate around it so uh, you can get all kinds of rocking and rolling stuff going on you can get all the air coming out one millisecond out of one side of the fan not not hardly any air coming out the other side and stalled stalled fans tear themselves apart i had a a many years ago i had a 60 inch plenum fan had a half inch plate holding the blades together and with the shaft attached to it and in a uh, puerto rico in a pharmaceutical building and what happened is uh at night it was only a day shift they closed all the dampers and somebody forgot to turn the fan off so basically it pumped all night against the deadheaded against dampers. Must have been really good dampers because usually they leave mm. during that. And uh, and so it actually tore the tore through this half inch back plate and tore this 60 inch wheel off the shaft. Wow. And it's a fatigue test. You know, I've, I've had friends who are helicopter pilots that say helicopters are just flying fatigue tests. Well, a stalling fan is a running fatigue test mm. and, and eventually it will fall, fail. 
and in the and and many times what happens is uh <clears throat> is these fail in the middle of the night because what happens the 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 circumstances that happen that cause failure, and we'll talk more about that, typically happens when nobody's around. So they can be failing every night. Nobody knows about it. They're fine when you come in in the morning and over a period of time. So if anybody comes to me and said, hey, the fan frame is cracked or we've this fan has bounced off its isolators and it's the third time or, or something like that, I can get, almost guarantee you that fan's installed. Mm. <clears throat> And Mark, we had a quick question. Which one of those uh, diagrams denotes the the stalled? Oh, the the current? lower one is the stall. Got it. So so obviously we want nice even flow coming out all the way around the fan. So and you know and it's really a dynamic thing. Like I said, it's and 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 if you've ever been around fan stalls, you can walk up to the piece of equipment and you can actually hear it. So. One of the things I always do if I think a fan's installed is go to the inlet side of the fan or the filter door, open the door, and if the, everything smooths down and it starts sounding nice and smooth, then you are you could be pretty sure that fan was running installed. That's the indicator. Got it. That's the indicator. You mm -hmm. And what you've done is you just relieve some pressure off that fan so now it can pick up. You've got enough flow across those blades for, the, for them to do their lift again. Mm. So... <clears throat> so... So we talked a lot about stall. I'm going to go through some basic definitions. You know, obviously we're going to talk about flow, which is, you know, meter cubic meters per hour in SI units or feet, cubic feet per minute uh, here in the U.S. Um, there is a concept, you know, a lot of times you hear things talked about as normal flow, which is the scientific term for that. But more often in the HVAC industry, we hear people talk about standard flow or SCFM. And this is the flow or the basically the mass flow through that that fan at standard uh, atmospheric conditions 70 degrees 29.92 inches of, of mercury that's sea level at 70 degrees you know uh, so <clears throat> many things we are sloppy about in the hvac industry and if you live at <laughs> 600 feet you can be sloppy about altitude but if you right. live in Denver, Colorado at, at 5,000 feet, uh, SCFM is not the thing to be designing with. You mm -hmm. have to look at, you have to do density correction. We're going to talk about that. And velocity through here, which is a very important uh, concept that we're going to talk a lot about. You know, obviously the speed of the air going by. Um, now in fans, people talk about total static pressure. We talk about velocity pressure and we talk about static pressure. So so those are three different types of pressure. So the total pressure is not only the pressure across the fan, how much it pressurizes the duct downstream, but also the momentum of the air that's going through there. So the velocity pressure is the momentum, and we'll define that here in a minute. And in plenum fans, because they typically aren't implied in, in ducts, then, then we don't have a good handle on what velocity pressure is. Mm. So uh, many plenum fans are rated in static pressure. Most house fans are rated in total pressure. So it's kind of an apples and oranges. You got to be a little careful about. Um, uh, when we look at that density, at that difference between SCFM and ACFM, actual CFM versus standard CFM, the difference is really a ratio of the density. So how thick is the air you're moving? <clears throat> and in HVAC, we're not running at mock speeds and we're not running and we always kind of treat air as a, a compressible fluid, uh, but we don't spend a lot of time on that. So, uh, so we ignore a lot of those things because we're really looking at relatively low pressure. So the velocity pressure is the velocity divided by 1096.7, the quantity squared in, uh, that's in, in IP units. And many times what, what we do, us people that live around sea levels, we say velocity divided by 405, the quantity squared is the velocity pressure. That's the pressure uh, equivalent of the momentum going through there. But if you're at altitude, that 405 is not the right number. You have to use put the density number in there. Don't do that in Denver. Don't do that in Denver. Right. And you know, uh, and if we're, we're, we're talking, uh, 
water gauge, if we're doing it in metric units, obviously the, the numbers are a little bit different. It's the velocity divided by 1.661 or, or the density times the velocity squared divided by two. <clears throat> now, the, the reason these velocity pressures are really important is because most of the losses in an HVAC system are proportional to the velocity pressure. So there's a, a lot, if you go into ASHRAE duct fitting database, if, if you go into a lot of things, you'll see a C factor that says the, the pressure drop across this device is this C factor times the velocity pressure. <clears throat> and that C factor can range from zero or almost zero to up to, to as much as four. And sometimes you hear people talk about losing a velocity pressure head. If you just take a duct work piece of duct and blow it out to an open space, you'll lose about one. Uh, that has about a C factor of one. So you'll lose that velocity pressure when you try to turn it into, uh, into um, static pressure. Basically you lose it. <clears throat> if you do air distribution devices, sometimes they call this a K factor. I don't know why it's just, been in the but it's really used the same way you're still looking at the velocity coming in k times velocity pressure is the loss and like i said you can find these in the ashray duct fitting databases many component manufacturers will give that to you and that is that is true for any flow that is what we call developing turbulent flow certain devices like flat fin coils and heat wheels have laminar flow uh, which where, where the pressure drop across them is proportional to the velocity, not the velocity squared. But we, we're not going to talk a lot about that. There aren't very many devices like that. So the basic fan formula that everybody's uh, familiar with is that the flow Q is proportional to the, is directly proportional to the speed. <clears throat> and, um, there's a term here that most people don't aren't familiar with, and D is not density, it's fan diameter. So for fan manufacturers, uh, you're allowed to extrapolate up. And actually on most fans above 36 inches or something, most of the data you see from fan manufacturers is extrapolated. The Ampka lab in Chicago can do about 40,000 CFM. I mean, it's just a limitation of their laboratory. Mm. The, my laboratory at Aon, which which is extremely large, can do 100,000 CFM. So we're one of the biggest airflow labs in the world at this point. And most uh, fan manufacturers have mimicked Ampka because that's the people that they're certifying their products to. So anything that does more than 40,000 CFM, we've had to extrapolate up from a smaller fan. And the rules are that smaller fan has to be exactly dimensionally proportional. And since that's not ever really true, uh, it usually, there's a little bit of conservatism if you extrapolate to bigger fans, but not if you, if you take it down and say, I tested a 60 inch fan and I'm going to see what a 15 inch fan does, because you can't keep things like the gap between the wheel and the inlet cone consistent. For manufacturing and for application and service, usually the gap between the wheel and the cone is about a quarter inch because the fans are spinnings. They're not perfectly round. The inlet cone's not perfectly round and the mechanics putting it together aren't doing it with micrometers. You know, this is, this is a low cost piece of sheet metal, not a highly machined turbine. So, uh, so you do, so there's a tolerance gap and that quarter inch gap is the same gap on a quarter inch fan and an 84 inch fan. And that gap is a loss in efficiency. So you can see that it's going to be a whole lot more percentage loss, uh, in a small fan than it is a big fan. So, yeah. <clears throat> um, so the pressure varies as the square. So if you speed that fan of the speed or by, uh, by association by the flow. So if you want to do twice the flow, you're going to get squared the, the uh, it's going to, it's going to square the pressure. And there again, there's that D term about it's the square of the diameter. And now we're correcting for density. So fans are volumetric machines, which means they take so many CFM from one side at a certain speed and move it over here. 
What really varies is not the mass flow through it. It's the uh, the pressure and the mat and the the pressure and the mass change as you do that, and the horsepower amount of work it does. So it's a little different. Most devices, we if you use that FCFM number and you figure out the loss and mass flow, that works really good for that device. Fans don't. You always correct the. You don't correct the CFM. You correct the pressure and you correct the power, which is the next one we're talking about. Power increases as a cube. So you can see the power goes up very, very fast as you speed a fan up. Pressure goes up fast, but the power goes up even faster. And and there again, it's directly proportional. If I move, to, you know, if I have one pound of air I'm moving across that fan and I move two, it takes twice the power to do it. So. Uh, so you, it's, it's also proportional to that density ratio. So, so th these are kind of all the, all, all the fan laws that we, we put together. So this could be the first time in history fan laws have been discussed live on LinkedIn, Mark. So oh, okay. we're breaking new, well, and I'm breaking new ground. <laughs> th these are laws. These aren't suggestions. Fans in general right. run on the fan curve. You can muck them up, and we call that system effect. We're going to talk about that. So uh, kind of the general feel for this, if I want 10% more air, I speed the fan up 110%. I speed up 10%, right? But I'm going to get 121% more pressure when I do that, and I'm going to need 133% more power. So if you miss your selection point on your fan and you have to speed it up to get there, the first thing that's going to happen to you is going to run out of horsepower. Mm. Yep. So, so if you need 10% more pressure, I can't get enough pressure across the fan, then you only have to speed it up 5%, but you're still gonna get 116% more horsepower. Like I said, that horsepower is what always gets you. Mm. So, so, you know, these are all these- the horsepower is usually more involved than just putting in the motor. Right, you put the, yeah. then sometimes you end up talking about, well, did I run a big enough wire to it? Is electrical yeah. service big enough? It can get very, very expensive. Yes. You, know, you got a drive, then you may have to go up drive sizes. So, uh, so here, these are these, so we can draw these different selection points along a fan curve, wherever that intersection. And so these system curves are, uh, <clears throat> are all the red lines. And then if we change the speed of that fan, um, we get a family of curves of pressure curves. So we can kind of look at the different places where the system curve intersects the speed curve. And that's where we're going to make our selection at. Mm -hmm. Everywhere along that system curve, <clears throat> if you look at that, uh, that dark red one, this one here, this is always at the peak of this fan curve because of the fan laws. So, People don't run these fans at all different speeds when they develop them. You use the, the fan laws as how you draw all these different speeds, how you determine how to act at different speeds, at different pressures. Uh, these all follow along, but this is the same point proportionally on that fan curve. It's always the peak. And uh, so <clears throat> as you go up and down that fan curve, you stay at the same, what we call point of operation or same proportional or relative position scaled position on that fan curve that's really important when we talk about vav systems so mm -hmm. that system curve is looks looks like the pressure times some derived uh constant x that that equals uh the the flow squared that's just a rewriting of that one of those fan laws so you can draw that system curve you have an operating point you have a selection point i need this many cfm at this static pressure i can calculate what the system curve looks like for that and draw that on the fan curve <clears throat> so you know typically you're not matching one of these your system just defines for you how much duct work you got and everything else you do the calculation yeah, so you drive a, your system curve from the system, but it is a characteristic of the system. It's not a characteristic of the fan. I can put all kinds of different fans. The system curve doesn't stay, this stays the same. It's what happens in the building. It's how much duct work, how much diffuser, how much damper coil you put in, in, in that path. <clears throat> so, so we're going to select a point, right? 
and we're going to select uh, this point, on, let's say right here. We want this much static pressure, this much flow. And, <clears throat> and if you notice, that doesn't give us, if we have just a little bit more static pressure than we think we do, then we automatically move all, we can move way far to the left of that and get into that unstable region of that fan, that area where that fan's running in stall, where it's pumping sometimes, not pumping sometimes, and it will eventually tear itself apart. <clears throat> so, um, mm. so, you know, where you pick that fan on that fan curve, I always say depends on the toler on the competence you have on where you're making your selection. So I talked to lots of consulting engineers. I, I was a consulting engineer starting out early in my career. And you run into all kinds of different levels of skill and attention to detail, just like you do with any kind of people. You know, I've run into guys that say, I select all my rooftop equipment, with two and a half inches of external static on every job I do. That's probably not the right answer. And mm -hmm. then you can run into the guys that say, okay, in room 304, that duck coming in on the north side has 3.4057896 inches of static pressure in it. You know, whether he's right or not, he did the calculation, right? But right. uh, even if the engineer is that guy and he did the calculation perfect, what if the sprinkler guy got there first and they right. had to rearrange right. the ductwork to get around it? You know, I, yeah. I also spent some time as a contractor. And the number one rule of sheet metal contracting is be there before the sprinkler guy. Because <laughs> they run the sprinkler lines dead center through the ceiling cavity. So right. <laughs> if you're not there first. So, you know, so it's, it's very important to you can't you got to determine how much and the farther to the right on that fan curve you select the more leeway you have right now you remember right. those efficiency curves as you slide off to the right at some point once you get past that peak point <clears throat> you know and that peak static point or peak efficiency points just a little bit to the right of that stall point um you may not want to select at that at that peak efficiency point on every job how much confidence do you have and mm -hmm. and um uh, of that curve and by the way we say these these system curves are fixed but we have filters and they get dirty so actually they're not fixed you know as the filters load up get dirtier the static pressure through the system changes and and um and if you want to, if you, if you're in an application that requires you to maintain a certain CFM, things like clean rooms, uh, operating rooms and hospitals and other things like that, you may want to speed that fan up and maintain, measure and maintain that flow through that space. And this, what happens in during the dot com uh, boom, when we were building lots of clean rooms, electronics, new chip manufacturing. They were doing a lot of this, and this is where we discovered bearing pitting. Because it turns out if you use a VFD and you run a fan at the same speed for a very long period of time, because these static pressures don't change, they change very slowly, that you build up a very high static charge across the motor to the fan or the casing because you're switching these at a high frequency and uh, and it'll actually arc across the balls and the bearings and pit the bearings. So, you mm -hmm. know, people that uh, in those type applications, it's very common to see people wanting ceramic bearings or shaft grounding kits or stuff. That's where that came from. Right. Is, is the VFDs on there. We're not going to talk a lot about that, but if you've ever walked up to a fan that wasn't grounded, that had a VFD on it and you touched the frame, you won't, you will look next time because it, it won't kill you but there's oh it'll there's shock a lot it. of current not yeah. a lot of current but there is a lot of voltage and you it can will, feel it huh i've never it, experienced it, that yeah it it will yeah it's you know it's you know it's it can be like grabbing hold of a 110 wire hmm. i mean it can make your arm hurt for a couple of days <laughs> so yeah it, it can be a lot so uh <clears throat> yeah, we do a lot of surgery suites with HEPA filters and right. airflow is critical. So we're always airflow is critical. So you can do that. And yeah. so you, that's that's an application for you. Probably you might want to consider a grounding kit. You also want to make sure that that fan is grounded. So if it's on rubber right. or isolators and really well isolated, then you want to make sure there's a ground strap on it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so 
Now let's enter VAV systems. So the traditional way to control a VAV system was to set a pre static pressure sensor two thirds of the way down the duct um, and control a constant static in that system. And variable volume systems really are like VAV systems you see in, in, um, in buildings, but they also are variable uh, um, central exhaust systems for lab, lab hoods and other things act the same way so <clears throat> so there may be a reason to maintain the pressure so if from people that sell vav boxes a vav a pressure independent vav box typically needs about three quarters to one inch across it to, to throttle and control properly so usually you want that three quarters to one inch at the farthest run of your duct and you back it up to where you put that static pressure sensor and in a typical setting on that static pressure sensor control might be one and a half to two inches or something. <clears throat> so what you're really telling the control system to do is that zero flow, when all the boxes completely shut down, maintain this certain static pressure. Well, what happens to you is you actually cross into this stall point. And that's what I said. This usually occurs in the middle of the night Building shut down, all the dampers go shut, the space is satisfied, uh, the fan slows down as far as it can. Remember, tip speed control static. At some point, it's not spinning fast enough to make the static. Mm -hmm. It's it's install, it's 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 going up and down in speed. It it basically tears itself up overnight. But we come in and it three in the four in the morning, we do a flush cycle and then people turn lights on and people start coming in. And by the time anybody's there to know about it, everything's up and running and up, up in the other part of the curve. So, <clears throat> so I, I always call that control static. A lot of people call it, uh, other things. And we're going to talk about how to get our get, typically get past that. Um, but you know, there is a, a limit to when you can turn that down. And so the, your system curve no longer look, goes to zero, zero. So it's, it's the pressures times the coefficient times the flow squared plus that control static in there. So that keep, if you're in a constant volume, um, uh, if you're doing a constant volume BAV single zone system or a single zone system, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about this. But if you have something in the system, like a VAV damper that's changing the pressure drop through the system dynamically in response to flow or sash hood position or something else, you have to worry about this. Right. Mm -hmm. So how do you avoid it? Well, if you select farther to the right on the curve, you'll have more run room before you run into that stall. So if you look at the green curve, you know, I've got this much turned down from full flow where I only had the blue curve turned down on this other one. And the way you select a fan farther to the right on the curve is you put in a smaller fan and you run it faster. Mm -hmm. Now, please check to make sure that it'll run at that speed. But, uh, you know, um, so you right. know, putting a smaller fan in the system is not always cheating or doing something cheaper it's actually moving you farther to the right of the fan curve and so this so many times if i'm selecting a piece of equipment almost every fan program will give you a whole selection of fans at a static pressure and flow and they have to order them in some way and they usually order them in efficiency so that very top fan is probably the blue fan and if you go down two or three you're at the green fan so right it's very often that I'll say, I don't, you know, I'll look at the fan curves to kind of see where I'm at, but it's, you know, I always feel better if I select the second one down, not the first one. Right. Because that good just gives me a, it just gives me a little more run room. Yep. And by yep. the way, as we turn down on these curves, you know, we're getting closer and closer to that peak. So some point along that curve, we actually are going to hit peak efficiency. And, you know, remember, we're designing these buildings at a 1% weather condition. It's only there 1% of the time. And that's a, assuming the engineer didn't have any conservatism in his design, which almost never happens, right? There's always a little extra uh, uh, slop in there. So, right. Uh, so if I always say when I walk up to a VAV system in a building, 
fully occupied building, middle of the day, it's almost always running at 75% speed. You know, it's just kind of where it is for 75% of its design. Well, that may be very close to your peak static. I mean, your peak efficiency uh, point. So you're really not designing a system that uh, that is not running at peak efficiency because you selected a fan that wasn't at peak efficiency at that 1% design point. Right. So uh, I tend to talk faster than I put words up, Tony. So. You're doing great. This is really good. Anyway, Thank you. That's the, no, the you're doing words awesome. are for the PDF. So, okay. So, <laughs> you're doing great. So, you know, so like I said, this, that's that uh, turn down at level. And I think actually we got those these slides swapped somewhere along the line. So, oh, okay. So let's talk about, you know, so picking farther to the right one way. Another way to do this and one that's become extremely popular lately is to do fan arrays. If we put multiple fans in parallel and we put backdraft dampers on those fans where I can turn one off and air just doesn't go in a circle, go backwards through that fan, which you got you have to do, and that costs you a little efficiency too on that fan because there's another pressure drop. But then you can take that fan curve and stage those fans off and change the net effective curve. So the the one over here on the far, this is four fans running. Remember that you're running all these fans at the same speed. So their peak static and set by speed is always the same, but I'm gulping more air with four fans than one air fan. So I've got more flow. And as I turn fans off, then my uh, stall system curve where I pass that magic stall point keeps coming farther and farther to, to the left. So you keeps get moving very, over. Keeps you get very low over. turn yeah. turn you can get very low turn downs with with these and it's a simple system nice that, that's easy to control plus you get some redundancy which is always nice and you get some redundancy you know so um so that you know this this is a very popular thing you're seeing this a lot mm -hmm. now the ultimate way to control any kind of vav system be it lab hoods or 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 building vav is that we all have DADC controls in almost all our buildings now. And we know the damper position of every box in the building because it's all networked together. So if you can get the control guy, the building management control guy, this is the trick to survey all those boxes and say, hey, I'm going to lower that control static in that duct so that the, the worst box in this building is open 80 or 90 percent right right i'm right. not got, easy, i'm i'm right. not making any more pressure than i absolutely have to have to make right because if this they're all at 50 the percent and you're still controlling the two and a half inches you're wasting inches, a whole bunch you're of just energy. burning yeah. horsepower across the damper it's really what you're doing so you pull so, the boxes and then you, you reset the, the, st the discharge for, static for back hand. until they open up Oh, Basically. until they, until they open up. So this right. may be the accountant on April 14th on a Sunday and, you know, and, and he may have the office right off the air handler, you know, right. so it takes very little static to run the rest of this building. Right. So this is the ultimate, but it's, you know, I, I always say, and I'll probably insult a whole lot of control guys, but my experience, especially back when I was a contractor, is the control guy showed up on startup day and said, okay, what do you want to do with this? So sometimes, you know, it's it depends on how good your control guys are, mm -hmm. really, and where they're willing to do this. It's a little tricky to make, it takes a lot of commissioning and a lot of work to make it work, but it is the ultimate. And, and controlling that static. And you could do that with a fan wall too. You know, you still make it at the ultimate, you know. Right. And, and the other nice thing about doing fan arrays is, is that, uh, you know, there's nothing more efficient than off. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you're not running those fans, uh, you have very good efficiency. So that's kind of the ultimate. So let's talk about system effects. So, the worst system effects happens on house fans. And and so you kind of have to, to understand that. You kind of have to understand the anatomy and how these are put together. So you got this housing. You got this wheel in here that we've seen lots of pictures of with the blades in it spinning around. And this housing that progressively as it goes around gets wider and wider until it gets to the discharge. And this 
housing increases the efficiency of that fan. Mm -hmm. And all these, there's a piece of sheet metal inside that fan that comes up in there that kind of strips the air off the blades so it doesn't keep going around because you can't make this zero tolerance down here called a cutoff plate. And, and fan designers play with the cutoff plate and, and do that to get the most efficiency. Between the cutoff plate and the housing, that's how they get, they maximize that for efficiency. But in general, if that cutoff plate in an FC fan covers about 50% of the outlet area uh, and in a backward inclined fan or airfoil or backward curve fan, it covers about 20% or 25% of the, of the flow. So, <clears throat> so, so that's kind of how house fans are put together. Uh, and I talked about, see. Now, what happens in these fans is because it's spinning around and coming off this housing, it's coming off the top of that housing very, very, very fast. And actually, if you put a probe in here down at the very bottom of the duct, you might even me measure a negative static pressure. And it takes about two and a half equivalent duct diameters to, for that to even back out. And, for a house, you know, for a typical house fan. For a typical house fan. Right. And I've done this in the laboratory. I've measured fans, put duct on them, and they perform a whole lot better without it. I mean, with the duct. Then you take the duct off, same situation. You'll mm -hmm. see the static pressure and flow drop. And this is a real thing. And, <clears throat> and it, you know, it's, it's about two and a half duct diameters at 2,500 uh, gross discharge velocity that you know the cfm divided by the area of the duct coming out and and so obviously you don't want to put um some component in there really very close to that fan because because you've got a really really high velocity spot velocity going through there mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that equivalent duct length is very important and like i'm sure that everybody installs their aon rooftop units on the duct and gets a good like 10 feet of straight duct down off. absolutely absolutely every, every yep. time well you know that's not how it happens we use mostly plenum fans too for a reason they don't have an inducted discharge but you know this happens constantly yeah go go in your house and see what you've got you've got an fc fan in there you don't have a good duct straight duct so mm. so it's a it's a loss that we live with but not a loss that shows up in the fan data so so gotcha and on top of that, if you take an elbow like this elbow C and you turn that very rapidly right off it, and and it, the old guys like me call this breaking the back of the fan, where you where you turn this a, across here, mm -hmm. then then your loss coefficient, if that was right on there, would be 3.7 times, five times the velocity pressure. So if you had 4,000 feet a minute coming out of that fan, it would be 3.75 inches for an FC fan loss. Well, that fan probably doesn't do 3.75 inches. Mm. So, so it's a huge number. And you can kind of see from these curves that it's worse for FC fans mm -hmm. than it is with for backward inclined fans. And if you turn it the other way, it's much better. It's only like a little less than one for a backward incline and a little about two for a, and turning sideways is just the same as breaking the back. So wow, the problem pretty, is this still pretty hefty. Yeah. 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 The, the problem is this, this air going really fast through here. Doesn't see the turn signal. Doesn't know it has to turn, right? Mm -hmm. It's just going to slam into the backside of that. And you get a huge loss from that air just blasted into what's mm -hmm. basically a flat plate. So, I mean, you, and, and turning veins and anything else in there isn't going to help you much because all that air is crowded up at, at the very yeah. top. So mm. very, very important concept. You know, the other thing is if you're going to blow through something, a lot of times you've got that very high velocity coming off this fan and you're going to blow through a coil or a filter or, uh, or, uh, something, then the pressure drop through that device is going to be the spot velocity, not the gross velocity. We just always assume it's the gross velocity. And so you're only going to use a little piece of that coil or a little piece of that fan. So uh, a lot of times they'll put diffusers on here, put perforated plates, break up that velocity 
So uh, this is just a chart that I put together years ago with different types of diffusers on 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 different um, and some of the pressure losses. So the reason I really like plenum fan is if I've got to blow some through something and I can't get that two and a half duct diameters through it, I'd rather just pressurize the plenum to start with. And I have just good turbulent, but fairly even flow coming off that fan. Not, right. not this jet trying to go through this little spot that I've got to deal with. But, you know, FC fans, because of the way they're made and because of, of where the cutoff plate to get the efficiency out of them, they're, they are much higher spot velocities than others. Now, on the fan inlet, and this applies to airfoil or backward incline airfoil, FC fans, any of them, they're all sensitive to inlet. So on a plenum fan, my experience is, is you have to try really hard to mess up a plenum fan in a box. Mm. If you crowd it so much that the air just has no place to get out around its perimeter, you'll, it'll start uh, affecting it. But, but if you mess up the inlet on any of the fans, you'll see a drop in performance. And we call all these things system effects because there are things that happen in a system that didn't happen in a lab. And, and they all look like static pressure. Mm -hmm. they, they really do. It's just that you can't get a probe in there and properly measure it. So uh, like on a, on a plenum fan, all the air, you know, the, there again, that air isn't really going to make this turn like this. It's going to come in here. It's going to get sucked up through here. Most of it's going to go out the top. We could even be stalling the bottom blades because we're, we can't get enough air into them because mm -hmm. we've got velocity pressure coming in, helping us here and not here. And same thing happens on a house fan because you're, you know, on a double width house fan, you're doing that twice, one on each side and trying to get it in. So if, if you're a fan designer, if you're, you know, and you know, there are certain rules and certain things we do used to do in built up systems that we do in custom equipment because we can't test everything. The biggest abusers of this is packaged rooftop equipment and unitary equipment. And we get by with it because we test it. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's a space constrained product. Nobody wants a 20 foot long, three ton rooftop unit, right? So, uh, so sometimes you have to, there are all, tra always trade offs in engineering. And, and sometimes you trade off great practice and you get a little less performance out of your component. Right. The important thing is you got to understand what it is. First, you have to understand that it's there. And then you have to understand, then you have to compensate for it so that you don't think it's doing something it's not. Right. So, you know, here's, so typically a house fan, the diffusion angle, 90% of that air will come out in about a five degree, five degree cone coming out of that fan. That's just kind of been my experience. Mm. And then you can put diffusers and things and get that spread out to about 25 degrees. Uh, uh, but that makes house fans putting it in, uh, inside blow through applications where you've got something very close that you got to blow through, uh, less efficient than, than you'd like for them to be. But this traditionally has been the fan you saw, especially all at lower cost HVAC equipment. Right. And, 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 you know, if you're draw through, if it's the fans, the last thing in the cabinet and you can get some straight duct off of it, it works great. So, yep. So, hey, Mark, before I'll, you hit the last yeah. section here, just really quick, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. I just want to remind folks, um, I'll give you a little bit of a break. And if, if you all need your PDH certificate, email me. There's my email there. It's also in the little ticker on the bottom. We'll leave it there the whole time. Also, Mark has offered to uh, for me to email you the PDF of this presentation. Yeah. So, um, and if you like what Mark's doing, and I hope you do, please like this video, we greatly appreciate it. If you got to run, we understand, but just email me. Um, we have another section here that we're going to stick around. And if you got any questions, we got a few in the chat. We'll be glad to ask any questions. So um, we got one more. Great. And this is Mark, you're doing a great job. This is really good information. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, I've got, I got just a, a few more slides. I want to talk a little bit about fan efficiency. Yeah, metrics. no problem. I've, Take I, your time. I've, li I've lived through this and this is pretty short, but I want everybody to be aware of it because I think there's a lot of um, lack of awareness here of, of what's going on. So 
the first, well, the first fan efficiency grade that was around for years in ASHRAE 90.1 was horsepower per CFM. And, and you still see that in specs. But in 2013, actually slightly before that, I was sitting on the technical committee at ASHRAE for fans 5.1. And the 90.1 committee standards committee came to the fan guys and said, Hey guys, can you come up with a better way to do fan efficiency? And so a uh, gentleman named John Cermak, who was the chief engineer for Acme went off and developed what we called FEG. And so fan efficiency grade hmm. and fan efficiency grade said, Hey, these are standard. If, if your fan has to have a peak efficiency that meets this fan efficiency grade and it varied by impellers, you know, I talked earlier that smaller fans are less efficient than bigger fans because of that gap and other things, aerodynamic reasons. So you can kind of see that as this rolls off as you get up there around, you know, 30, 30 inches and bigger, it begins to really flatten out now. This was developed by the fan manufacturers. So I always think it's interesting that 70% F, uh, 70% fan efficiency is a 75% FEG. Seems a little optimistic, but <laughs> it's just a number. <laughs> is, the, <laughs> but, uh, is, the, is the number like the FEG 75, is the 75 the percent or is it the um, diameter of the fan? Well, it's a fan rating. A so, fan rating, okay, got gotcha. it. fan rating. So that FEG 75, if you have a specification that says I need to be FEG 75, for a 30 inch fan, that'd be about 70%. But as you got out here to say a 10 inch fan, then you could be just a little above 60. Hmm. Or uh, actually a little below 60 and still meet that FEG. Because they were, this was an attempt to account for the fact that small diameter fans just can't be as efficient as larger diameter fans, even though they were made scale models of each other, you know, got it. So, um, so <clears throat> it was, it was FEG metric was referenced in, in AMCA standard. It was at 90.1 for a number of years. And then, um, and FEG was based on brake horsepower. So shaft input power. It didn't take into account motor efficiency. It did not take into account drive efficiency. And, uh, you know, basically it said there was kind of a vague term that says, Hey, and by the way, you ought to be selecting within 15% of the peak efficiency because this is peak efficiency. This is as good as a fan as it gets. So what happened in, when they put FEG in, there were some fans that got knocked out of the market because they were below the the 90.1 minimum um, at the time and even today fans are not federally regulated so it's not against the law to sell one below that but generally uh, the engineering community and HVAC we we consider ASHRAE the standard of care doing a good job if you end up in court that's who's going to get pulled out mm. and so ASHRAE 90.1 is kind of the uh, voluntary law we all abide by this right is, we, you right. know this is what we do so that that was in that at, at that point in time <clears throat> so um actually starting in 2015 and went into the 2019 90.1 we changed the efficiency index and we changed it to fei so the fan guys got together and said hey we don't like FEG, it knocked part of our products out of the market. Uh, <clears throat> uh, less, and, and we think we should go wire to air. So meaning how much power goes in. So let's pull in motors and drives into this efficiency. And so we're gonna create a metric, which they called FEG. And they went to the US Department of Energy and said, please regulate us because by the way, we've read the EPAC 1975 and you have the authority to regulate us and you're not. Please federally regulate it, make this a law. <clears throat> and, um, and here's a metric for you to use. And of course, uh, when you go to a bunch of lawyers and ask them to do something, they can't stand not to change it. So they changed it to FEI, which is an index to a, a typical fan. Anyway, it's the same numbers, but, uh, right. Meanwhile, the HVAC guys who'd been regulated for a number of years, 
told all their fan buddies, what are you crazy? Why would you ask the government to regulate you? But that's, that's right, another side right. story. So, <clears throat> so 20, that's a whole other, that's a whole other meeting. That's, that's a whole other, other talk. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a, that's a, over a beer conversation. Usually. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And and so I know about this because I was actually on the negotiated rulemaking with with uh, with the U.S. Department of Energy in the summer of 2015, and we met in a windowless conference room in in Washington D.C. two weeks a month from like May till November, and we couldn't agree. And in a negotiated rulemaking, everyone has to agree in the room. And it's really, a, it, it started with the federal government with CAFE standards, you know, miles per hour department of standards, or uh, Department of Transportation started doing it. And now DOE does it mm. because the government got tired of being sued by uh, industry over some new regulation they, they put out and, and because industry usually won. <laughs> so right right so so now we do a lot of negotiated rulemaking so there's about 25 people in the room we all sign a thing saying we're not going to sue you including the trade organizations for whatever device you're regulating and so i was on the one in 2015 and i was on the side of equipment manufacturers i'm also our company's also a member of amca so we basically were on both sides but uh since I was the guy there, I personally thought we shouldn't be regulated in products that were already regulated like rooftop equipment. Right. right. Don't regulate my regulations. So uh, that was a sticking point. AMCA wouldn't agree to it at the time. It was a failed negotiation. So as of today, there is no federal regulation on fans. Now they're starting it. Uh, and then, of course, how regulations are put in and how they are enforced very much depends who's sitting in the White House. And uh, a few years ago, we had a chain. This all happened under Obama. Uh, when we changed to Trump, all this went away. Now President Biden's in office, and now we're talking about it again. So there, uh, so you may see this fairly soon. But it is has been in ninety point one since twenty nineteen, and gotcha. it's uh, based on a standard called two hundred seven and two hundred eight. It is a wire to air metric, and it defines this bubble this these green lines are a little bubble <clears throat> um so here's the so you have to select your fan in this operating bubble now the difference between fei uh, feg and fei fundamentally is they're not regulating the fan itself they're regulating where you select the fan Right. Which is an interesting concept. And one of the reasons that I personally am not a big fan of this regulation, because the U.S. Department of Energy has the authority to regulate manufacturers, but they do not have the authority to regulate the general public, which includes designers and consulting engineers. So, right. so this is regulating where you select the fan on the fan curve, not because any fan will pass FEI if you run it slow enough is the way the math works. Hmm. So uh, regardless, so an FEI of one is pretty loose and it's not very onerous. So uh, what it does, sometimes when you get a return fan in those space constrained products and you're trying to run a, a backward incline plenum fan, at, at one inch of static pressure, which is probably, you know, way out here on the right side, you might fall outside the FEI envelope. But other than that, most people are selecting above this point on the fan curve in a decent efficiency range. Gotcha. But every three years, the U.S. Department of Energy reuses, renews all their energy standards which means ASHRAE 90.1 renews all their energy standards and they always get more stringent, right? So if we went to FEI of two in the extreme case, twice as good as current fan availability, then a lot of applications, we're not even gonna be able to make the static pressure. So we're regulating the consulting industry on how big the ductwork is mm. in effect. So, so, it's it's a it's an interesting concept as, hmm. as we shrink down and i go around and i give this i can't 
I don't even remember how many times. Hundreds of times I've given this talk to ASHRAE meetings and ASHRAE groups. I always say, okay, this has been in 90.1 since, since 2019. Has anyone ever heard of FEI? And uh, the first time I got the affirmative answer was in an ASHRAE meeting where one of the guys that I knew that was on the negotiated rulemaking had been, was in the room. So that was it. And, and then I've had a couple since then, but they've kind of said that's because this fan manufacturer gave us a lecture last month about fans and they talked about FBI. Right. 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 So right. it's, it's this thing that's been in 90.1 since 2019 and no one kind of knows what to do with it. You know, local building code people, it's, it's extremely complicated. It took me over a week to draw these lines on this. So you right. got to do it in a computer program. It's very complex. People don't really understand it, but I think it's important everybody be aware of it and it, it it's coming. It'll, it'll be here. We'll all be talking about FEI one of these days, I'm sure. But you know, mm -hmm. we in the air conditioning business are not always great at adopting new concepts in a very, very rapid fashion. So, right, right. <laughs> so, so it, it hasn't really hit the mainstream for the most part. So I guess I'm doing my part to get the word out. Like I said, it's not, it wouldn't gone the way I, I wish we'd have done something a little different. And the other thing is it doesn't really kind of take into effect that VAV effect that I talked about. It, it you know, it says where you're, it's still regulating selection point, not where you're operating. It's not looking at annual energy. So it's not really saving necessarily the energy you think it's saving. So there, there's like all single number uh, regulatory metrics. It, it doesn't do a great job. You know, it's, it's, right. it's, 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 it's a shortcut. That, right that that helps code officials do something simple and say yay or nay so so anyway that's kind of the end of my presentation you know i've got Excellent. some i've got some uh summary points here that you know basically are you know be aware of fei matrix use the right fan do, do a good job you know <laughs> so yeah 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 so you know uh I, I just looking and I haven't read, maybe you've been, I've been looking at my slides, not looking at the comments. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, we, we got a bunch of comments. Kevin looks like he says he caught a math error. I'm not swearing. There's not a math error. I'll go back and look at that. Uh, <laughs> we'll I apologize that, right? as there is, but I mean, I've given this, you know, at least 500 times and, and no Kevin, one's ever if you're seen the, it. if you're the guy, you caught it. So, he should get like a hat or a t-shirt. I'll keep yeah, him posted. Yeah, a hat or a t-shirt or something. Anyway, yeah, I'll, but... I'll go back and, and, and check that number because I, I wouldn't swear I'm not infallible. Yeah. No, no, no problem. Um, yeah, great. So that... No, that was really good information, Mark. And we're so glad you you came. We'll definitely have to do. Mark's got a, many very good presentations. Um, he will give us just a reminder. Uh, email me. My email is in the the the, the ticker on the bottom. Team Ormino at Insight USA, and we will send you uh, the certificate and also a PDF of this presentation, which I think is great to have in your back pocket and keep as a, a reminder about the different types of fans. And, yeah. fan and, and you all can check my math too then, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. so you don't want me checking your math. Let me just tell yeah. you right now, even though I'm going to have an engineering degree. But anyway, so like um, this one more quick thing. Uh, thank you all. Please, if you would like this video before you go, if you like what you saw, we appreciate it. And check out our other um, social media content. This video will be, we're streaming right now on YouTube and LinkedIn. So it'll live on our YouTube channel, which is HVAC, Insight Partners HVAC TV. Come check that out. We got a uh, we get about three subscribers of that channel a day and we have about 21 hours of view time a day on that channel so we greatly greatly appreciate it i will also at some point in the near future turn this live event into a podcast so you know if you want to have fun fun for the whole family you can listen about a fan presentation with your drive to the beach you know how much more fun can it get and then, <laughs> and then uh and then you know please connect with us here on linkedin and um please uh you know keep in touch we're gonna you know you could also email me for future presentations i when you email me for the pdh i also store that and i'll email you the next time we do a presentation especially when mark's uh, gonna be here so mark we we greatly appreciate you 
And um, we appreciate Aon as a partner of Insight Partners um, throughout the Southeast and uh, all of our sister companies and everything. And man, what a great job. We really appreciate it. And I, I had a lot of fun today. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, if you would stick around for a minute, I'll kill the feed here and we'll just talk for a few minutes. Okay. Uh, but thank you so much. And, and thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you. Yeah.